In the last two weeks, we've been looking at all of the social contract theory justifications for the state, for our political obligations to the state. Um, this week, we're going to do all the other obligations that there are. So it's a bit of a big week's lecture. Um, so it's probably time we got started with this. So the aim of the lecture is, as I said, we're going to go through other possible ways of justifying our political obligation, and two main ones in particular, the natural duty theory and the fair play theory, but then we'll also have a quick look at other possible theories. Remember, each theory is defined by a particular kind of moral theory which is taken to provide us with a reason to obey the law. So first I'm going to answer the question I left dangling from last week about what does John Rawls think gives us um, our political justification? Hint, it's the natural duty theory. Um, and then we will look at some of the problems with natural duty, and in particular, why some philosophers think that natural duties cannot give us a sort of obligation that political obligation is meant to be about. Then we'll go on to look at fair play doctrines, most commonly associated with H. L. A. Hart, famous legal scholar, um, but also widely advanced by various <coughs> other contemporary philosophers, um, and how they work, um, and some of the objections that have been given to them, and then, as I say, we'll finish off by quickly rushing through all the other possible theories and what seems to be wrong with them. So just a quick recap from where we are. We started off with classical social contract theory. That is the view that you are obliged to obey the law because you have consented to obey the law as a means of avoiding the problem that is defined by the state of nature. Then we, last week we looked at how John Rawls repurposes the social contract's arguments and the social contract tradition, but to somewhat different ends. Not by providing a justification for the state, but by providing a description of what justice is for the state. And he does that by moving from an actual state of nature to a hypothetical original position, and from a collective agreement to a mere individual agreement about what is the best state and what states could be just, and therefore states in which we would live, um, or choose to live if we had no idea what role we were going to play in those states. But we know what justice is for a state. Let's say we accept all his arguments. Why does that mean we're obliged to obey the law? Well, here's his argument. We have a natural duty to uphold theories of justice. I mean, it's sort of, it's wonderful in its audacious boldness. Just sweep the problem out of the way. You know, there is a duty that requires us to support and to comply with just institutions that exist and apply to us. What's more, these institutions don't even need to be perfectly just. They just need to be, in his words, as just as could reasonably be expected. And although this natural duty arises out of his contractarian arguments and his contractarian theory of what justice is, it applies to everyone. You don't have to consent either actually or tacitly. You don't have to agree. You have this duty, all of you, whether you like it or not. And the question is, why? And I have to say, Rawls is not particularly helpful on this position. Um, this, this wonderful bold statement is in some ways as good as you get out of Rawls for his justification of political obligation. But nevertheless, it's a very important account. So we really should take the time to work out what he seems to be talking about and why he thinks that we all have this duty, regardless of our voluntary act. Firstly, a quick word about what Rawls means by a natural duty. We came across previously the idea of natural laws. In both Hobbes and Locke, they both have the idea of natural laws and natural rights. For Hobbes, the natural law is something that is known by common sense. We just all appreciate what morality is, and we all have a desire to live according to the law. Locke has a slightly different understanding. For him, natural law seems to be something that is divinely ordained. Morality exists because God created it. This is the classic idea of the natural law and the natural right, and it's actually quite different to what Rawls means when he talks about natural laws and natural rights. Rawls has an entirely non-metaphysical conception of morality, and that includes natural morality. For him, a natural duty is merely a duty that obeys these three conditions. Okay, It applies to us without regard to our voluntary acts, 
We have, it has no necessary connection with the institutions or social practices, and it holds between persons irrespective of their institutional relationships. That's all. So when Rawls says you have a natural duty, all he means is you have a duty and it has these characteristics. <coughs> the other features of Rawls' theory of justice don't have these characteristics. They are defined by social cooperation and the institutions of a world of society. So he does think that the natural duty is something that is in many ways different to other parts of justice. The example he gives about why these kind of duties exist is the duty not to murder. He says, if you were to claim that we shouldn't kill people because we have consented to the law of not killing people, or even just because there is a law that says you shouldn't kill people, that would be ludicrous. You would be missing something vitally important about your moral obligation not to kill. It is not an obligation that rests upon laws or agreement or consent. It is just a duty that we all have, irrespective of our institutional condition. <coughs> so, why do we have a natural duty of justice? Well, we have a natural duty of justice, or we would all realise that we have a, neutral a natural duty of justice if we adopted Rawls's original position. That is, we considered what the right um, principles of justice for a well-ordered society must be. But it's important to realise that this isn't just another one of the principles that we agree to if we take the original position. Oh no, what Rawls is saying is, when you take the original position, you realise that your duty to obey the law and to uphold institutions of justice is equivalent to that duty against killing. That it would be ludicrous to expect any further justification for this duty. How does that happen? Well, I think it's helpful to start from the beginning again. <coughs> As I say, Rawls is very analytical. Often his arguments depend upon previous claims or the way he uses terminologies. So to start with, Rawls thinks that we all have some kind of innate conception of justice. This isn't what justice or morality is. This is just something that all of us arrive at naturally. We recognize that we need to have cooperation with others, and we recognize that in order for that to work, we need to accept and propose some kind of principles to govern how that cooperation happens. But we start off with very different conceptions of justice. Some of us might have intuitions to begin with that are quite similar to Rawls. Some of us might have utilitarian intuitions that what we all need to do is promote the greatest happiness. Some of us may have religious intuitions of divine command or natural law. Some of us might have Kantian intuitions. We all have some kind of sense of morality, but it's all different. Now, when Rawls proposes his principles of social justice, his theory of justice and fairness, through the hypothetical social contract, he's not arguing that we should replace those original, conditions, those original principles of justice. Sure, we might argue about them, we might change them over time, we might do all sorts of things, but that's not what the original position is about. What the original position is about is arriving at principles of social justice that work for everyone, regardless of their conception, original conception of justice. Now this is an argument in Rawls' theory of justice, which is the only set text you have for this course. It's much more part of Rawls' later writings on political liberalism and on justice as fairness. So this is something he says a lot more about, and in some respects I'm reading that past work into his early work, but it's all certainly still there. So when we reason about the original position and the social contract, we arrive at these principles of social justice. And those are the principles that we agree that we will adopt for the well-ordered society, for generally governing cooperation between people in social and the government of social institutions. But we still have to decide what kinds of principles we are going to use to govern our own lives. That's still a free choice we have. Maybe they'll be the ones that we started out with. Maybe they'll have been changed by the original position. But that is still free. There's still a lot of morality which, for Rawls, does not form part of political philosophy. In fact, Rawls thinks there's a very strict delineation between moral and political philosophy. So Rawls considers, once we have decided upon principles of social justice, then 
Still in the original position, we need to think about what the principles that we will use to each govern our own behavior might be. Now, if we contemplate at that point any principle of justice which is inconsistent with the natural duty of justice, which is inconsistent with our duty to uphold these institutions, we then, says Rawls, create an incoherence in our view about morality. This is because in any world society, which is what we're contemplating, everyone has got to uphold and accept the principles of social justice. And these principles of social justice are going to be um, realized by the institutions, the institutions that the duty of justice requires us to uphold. But if we accept the principle for our own morality, which is inconsistent with that duty, then there will come times where we don't uphold these um, institutions, where we in fact go against them and disobey them, maybe even seek to overthrow them. This isn't an inconsistency, says Rawls. You can say this, you can say, this is how I think society should be run, but I'm not going to go along with that in my own actions. But Rawls nevertheless thinks it's incoherent. So here's his argument, or here's one version of his argument. We start off with the idea that anyone who acts according to a principle that is inconsistent with our natural duty of justice will sometimes undermine principles of so the, the institutions of social justice, the just institutions. But, second premise, everyone in a well-old society accepts and upholds the principles of social justice that are realized by the institutions of justice. Therefore, if you are in a well-old society, you accept the principles that the institutions of justice are designed to satisfy. You think they're good principles. So here's the incoherence. If you are in a world of society, which you are at this point in the original position, and you accept any principle of individual morality which is inconsistent with the duty of justice, then you must you are upholding institutions, sorry, you will fail to uphold institutions that satisfy the principle that you yourself accept that institutions governing you should satisfy. Rawls doesn't like this. He thinks that this is a premise that you should reject. But since this follows from the other premises, what you should conclude is that you should not put yourself in the position of having to accept P1 or being the person described in P1. You should not put yourself in the position of accepting any principle of personal morality, personal justice, which is inconsistent with the duty of justice. Therefore, this is a natural duty. It applies to everyone. You've gone through the considerations of the original position. You have accepted rules and principles of justice as being the principles of social justice that could well order a society and then after that you simply realize oh look it would be now incoherent <coughs> for me to accept any principle of personal morality that is inconsistent with the duty of that the natural duty of justice so i have this natural duty of justice this kind of argument which rawls presents here is called a reductio ad absurdum these are quite common arguments in philosophy and they're very powerful arguments you take a premise that people would probably want to accept, or maybe several premises that people would want to accept, but you show that they imply something that they definitely don't want to accept. Therefore, you have to reject the starting premises and go on to something different. These arguments are strongest where the conclusion that people don't want to accept is a contradiction. In this case, it might be a contradiction if we came to the conclusion that, for instance, if you accepted the principles that were inconsistent with the natural duty of justice, then you would undermine just institutions which you were bound to uphold. That would be impossible. You can't not undermine and undermine an institution at the same time. If that was his conclusion, you would have to accept 
the argument and that you have a natural duty of justice. But he acknowledges that you can't get that kind of conclusion, and indeed we don't. To fail to uphold an institution of justice that satisfies principles that you accept just isn't the same as failing to uphold an uh, institution of justice that you uphold. But nevertheless, he thinks this is incoherent. This is something that we don't want. And he has this story he tells to give us further reasons to reject the P4, where he talks about um, the individual considering how they might vote, either in elections or as a public legislator. And do they at that point put their vote into upholding their principles, the just institutions, or do they vote against them? And here, indeed, they seem to be required sometimes by the principles of justice to vote for the just institutions, but required by their own principles to vote against. That is a much more contradictory statement. That's much more troubling. But that's premised upon the idea that we're in this situation and voting on whether or not to accept an institution of justice. <coughs> Most of the time, that's not what political obligation is about. Indeed, you might say, that's not an example of political obligation. You're politically obliged to obey the law. You are not, for all, meant to be politically obliged to vote in a certain way, be you an elector or a legislature. But there you go. That's his argument why we should be so eager to avoid this people. I don't know if you're satisfied by that argument or not. It's a bit of a letdown, I feel, after his really bold claim. But um, there are others. Before we go and talk about those others, though, I just want to say a few final points about Rawls's theory. The first is he thinks that this applies to all liberal democracies. That's not because liberal democracies are well societies. They're not. Liberal democracies often involve some people imposing principles of justice on others against their will. But nevertheless, he thinks that liberal democracies are as just as they could reasonably be in the circumstances. Now, Rawls just mentions this in passing. I think this is actually quite a big deal. Because the whole reason why Rawls thinks that we don't want to accept P4 is that we're left in this difficult situation of both wanting to undermine or not obey a just institution, but also recognising that it upholds the principles of justice that we accept. But if we have an institution of a state which is not perfectly just, but only as just as could be reasonably expected in the circumstances, then we already face this kind of dilemma. This institution will sometimes be telling us to do things that are contravene the principles of social justice. So what reason can we then have to say, well, you're still obliged to accept it? Now, he's probably at this point going to appeal to something like the general desire to uphold these institutions, that they're right most of the time, and we couldn't see how to make them better. But there isn't any premise like that in his argument, and there doesn't seem to be any premise like that in the text where he's talking about the natural duty of justice. So that seems to be a weakening of his argument, potentially quite a troubling one. The natural duty of justice doesn't extend to other states, though. It only um, belongs to the liberal democratic states. In other states, indeed, Rawls thinks that we have a duty to disobey under certain conditions. We don't have a duty to break the law because we feel like it because we want to. But there are situations of civil disobedience in which we might have a duty to disobey the law because through disobedience we could hope to make the state more just. His example of this would be that of the Indian resistance to British rule in the 1930s. The idea that you point out the flaws of your unjust state by disobeying its laws, by recognising that they simply do not apply to you, you are not bound by the natural duty of justice, and that the only way to get your obedience to these laws is going to be to replace these unjust laws with just laws. Finally, I just wanted to work this in somewhere. Rawls, it's very important to Rawls that our political obligations don't rest on consent. 
and he rejects the social contract theory. But he actually also has this very interesting argument against any kind of political obligation based on the social contract theory. Because he says, even if we have this paradigm case of actually consenting to laws, which almost all social contract theories recognize to be unrealistic, you can still say that the promises and the consent was forced. No one is bound, he says, to keep a promise under duress. So why should merely the fact that you have consented to a law bind you to it? So he's, you know, he's very committed to his natural duty of justice. It's not the only natural duty that he thinks we have, but it's one of them, and it's the one that leads to our political obligation. I said there were others. Here are two of my favourites. I think, in many ways, they seem to me anyway to make more sense. Um, Anna Stilts argues that we have a natural duty of justice because we all have a moral obligation not to impose our will upon others. Morality, she says, requires that we recognise those around us as being moral agents, just like us. And we have no right to make others act according to our will if they don't want to. But it's actually very difficult, either in the state of nature or just most of the time, to act in ways that don't subvert others to our will. Because we need to get on, we come into conflict. People need to win, people need to lose. Decisions need to be taken. When there is a democratic law, however, she points out, and we act within that law, we avoid this trap. We are able to act morally again. Because rather than me imposing my will upon another, the people collectively, and she has this wonderful word, omnilaterally, all at the same time, impose their wills on everyone else. We all agree on what the law should be through a democratic process. And then so long as we stick within that process, we can now resolve disputes and make decisions without one person having to impose their law upon others. And this is the only way to be a moral agent in a complex society. So, if we live in a complex society, we have to do this in order to be moral. That's the source of the natural duty. Alan Buchanan has a very different argument, but it has a somewhat similar form. He says we have a natural duty not to violate other people's human rights. Completely different moral theory, but equally compelling anyway. It makes sense. But he says, if your duty is to respect other people's rights, it's not enough that you simply not harm anyone. You also have to <coughs> uphold and respect the institutions that protect their rights generally. And for most of us, these are the laws of the state in which we live. If we didn't have these laws, even if we ourselves were good, other people might violate individual rights. And so it would be very bad for us to do anything that threatens the state and its laws. So these, these, these three principles that we've had all give us this generalised duty to obey the law, but they do so with some contingencies. They all require that something be true about the laws or the states in which we live. That's rather like Locke's theory, very different to Hobbes's. For Rawls's, in Rawls's case, the state has to be just, liberal democracy. For Stilts's case, it has to be democratic, it has to be truly democratic. Everyone has to have some say in how the laws are made. That's why we omnilaterally impose them on ourselves. For Buchanan, it has to respect human rights. Also, for all of these conceptions, the duty we have does not depend upon our institutional relationships. It is not a feature of our consent or agreement or our position within the state. Now, John Simmons thinks that this is the great weakness of all natural duty accounts. And he thinks it's because political obligation does seem to rest upon our institutional relationship with the state. You are only obliged, he says, to obey the laws of the country, of your country, either of the country that you're a citizen of, or that you're a resident in, or both. 
But you're not obliged just to obey any old law just because it happens to be just democratic or human rights, human rights respecting. But doesn't the natural duty argument give me just the same reason to obey the laws of other countries as those of my own? If France were a liberal democracy, which it is, a democratic society, which it is, and a society that respects human rights, which I believe it to be, why does the simple fact that I am an Englishman living in England mean that I am obliged to obey the laws of England and not the laws of France? Now, sometimes we may think that there are practical considerations. For instance, I obey, I obey the traffic regulations of England because I'm driving on English roads, and it's simply a coordination uh, problem. Some laws, you may think, well, you, know, you couldn't prosecute people across, across boundaries, they're not the institutions to implement justice. But, for instance, if in the Netherlands they think that it's just and legal to smoke marijuana, and in the UK they don't. Why is it wrong for me to smoke marijuana in the UK, but not in the Netherlands? Well, it's because I happen to be in the UK. But that's not a reason that can be provided by the natural duty of justice. Now, Rawls doesn't have very much to say about this. He doesn't. You know, the, the Simmons' argument came out after the theory of justice. Rawls doesn't respond to it. He is, you know, it seems to be a real problem for his theory of political obligation. The one thing he does say in his later work on the law of peoples is, well, we do all have a duty to respect and uphold other just laws and other just institutions around the world. But that's not what Simmons is arguing. Simmons isn't arguing that we should just respect the laws of France or the laws of Germany, but that we should be equally obliged to obey those laws as we are to obey our own country's laws. So that's the problem. Still, some Buchanan do have a response to this, at least a response of kind, because they argue that the natural duty is there to serve a particular purpose, be that to avoid imposing our wills upon others or to protect people's human rights. They can argue that, well, maybe it, respecting laws just doesn't serve that purpose when they're not the laws of the countries that we're in. If I smoke marijuana in the UK, I'm threatening its drug enforcement policies. I am undermining them. And those policies form part of the English state, which is what we have all agreed to, or which protects people's human rights, or whatever the various other principles that are out there might say. If I'm in the Netherlands, it's no threat. It's legal there. But if I choose to continue obeying the laws of the United Kingdom, that's not a threat to the UK law. I know. <coughs> so, maybe, maybe it's all right. Maybe if... I'm not a threat to the institutions of justice, and if my actions don't compose a human rights violation or an imposition of my laws upon others, maybe the natural duty of justice just doesn't apply to me. And that's why citizenship and residency matter. This is a bit of a troubling argument, of course, because there's nothing inherent about either citizenship or residency which neatly maps on to Stilts or Buchanan's principles. And I don't think going back to Hume's objection, that if you were to say to the magistrate, oh, it's okay, um, I was possessing marijuana in the UK, but I wasn't threatening the institutions of the UK, for whatever reason your argument might be, no one would take me seriously. I'm just an academic, we're all hippies. Um, <laughs> that they would see, okay, you know, you, you're not obliged. The obligation is meant to rest upon simply where you live, where you're a citizen of. Simmons has another objection to this argument, however. He says that, well, if that's all, if it's just the case that you're not obliged to obey the laws of another country because you don't threaten it, wouldn't it be very easy for countries to make you obliged to obey their laws? All they would have to do is arrange their laws so that you do threaten their institutions. If an English police officer were to go to the Netherlands 
look very disapprovingly at a bunch of dope smokers and you know, say that you're undermining all the principles of British justice, wouldn't that then constitute some kind of threat? And wouldn't they be obliged to say, oh, we're so sorry, and stop smoking because of that? This is, again, this is a reductio argument. That's not supposed to be the case. That's not how political obligation works. This is my country. It's meant to have a more solid edifice than just, you can make me obliged to obey the laws of another country by constituting your laws such that my disobedience would be a threat. <coughs> Again, it's not a reductio which ends in a contradiction, so it's a reductio we can get out of. We could just accept that that is the case. Maybe countries simply agree that they're not going to do this. <coughs> and indeed, there was a time in which countries did try and impose their laws all around the world. The United States, for instance, does believe that it has the right to collect tax from people who it sees as owing tax, no matter where they are. The United Kingdom, for a long time, upheld the rule of parliamentary sovereignty, which meant the United Kingdom Parliament believed that it could legislate for any part of the world it wished. It's not a legacy of the um, British Empire, but that's still debatable that actually that's the case. They simply choose to make all their laws only apply in England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, but they could choose otherwise. But it does seem a bit funny that that is how political obligation works. What about our third principle, the principle of fair play? Before I get on to this principle, I just want to say a few words about some of the terms being used here. Um, fairness is a very frequently used term in political theory, political, um, political philosophy. If you ask people about it, you tend to get led around in a really circular argument where fairness means justice and equity, and justice and equity mean fairness, and so on. Fairness actually has a quite a well-respected definition, albeit seldom written down. When people talk about fairness, they're talking about relationships. These can be real relationships between people, or they can be hypothetical relationships. But all the fairness doctrines that I've ever come across in moral and political philosophy all have this feature in common, that they're making the case that an ethical person doesn't only have to do the right thing themselves, doesn't only have to produce the right kind of outcomes to other people, but that they are bound to do something based on the relationships between people either real, such as friendship or co-citizenship, or merely hypothetical, such as a relationship of equality, or being better off or worse off than another. Fair play theory argues that political obligation is based on a relationship, and in this case it's a transactional relationship. We are obliged to reciprocate when other people act so as to benefit us. H.R.A. Hart has this argument for political obligation based on fair play. <coughs> on the grounds that other people benefit us by constraining their actions according to the rules of law. And that's a good thing, because it means that we can have property, it means that we can have safety and security, it means that we can collect taxes for public works. Because they agree to obey the law, and because we benefit from that, then we owe it to everyone else to obey the law too. This escapes the objection that the natural duty theory faced that it doesn't explain why we only need to obey our law, because of course we benefit in the UK from people in the UK obeying UK law. We don't happen to benefit from the people in France obeying French law, unless of course there is some arrangement such that their obeying French law has a direct impact upon us, but that in any case will be a much lesser concern. So this does explain why it is that we're only obliged obey the laws of our own country. Unfortunately, there are other problems with it. It's a common theme in the philosophy lecture, as you may have noticed. Um, Rawls actually started out his philosophical career believing that this was the right justification for our political obligations. He didn't start out with his theory of the natural duty of justice. But eventually he came to the conclusion that it's problematic. Because Hart conceives that we are in a cooperative endeavour. But most of the time, we don't see ourselves being a cooperative endeavour. And there doesn't seem to be anything implicit in benefiting from other people's obedience to the law. That means that we have to perceive ourselves as being in this state. So we argued, doesn't this 
principle of fair play simply come up against the same problems as that for social contract theory. That as just as people don't necessarily consent to the rule of the state, so they necessarily don't agree to be cooperating with others, and therefore for their ben the benefits that they receive provide them with an obligation to obey the law. Now he does actually keep the principle and he calls it the principle of fairness, and you'll come across it in the reading. But he keeps it as a non-universal um, non obligation. For some people, the principle of fair play gives them additional reasons to obey the law, but not everyone. So it doesn't provide us with this universal political obligation that we're looking for. In particular, he thinks that it applies to public office holders who have agreed to take part in the organization and running of their state that they have this additional duty, but not everyone else. Another person who doesn't like this argument for similar reasons is Robert Nozick, and this is probably the most famous objection to the fair play principle. He says that it just doesn't follow that because you are benefited from something, that you are obliged to reciprocate. He says Hart is getting confused and that what's actually doing the work is the agreement in his theory that we agree to be in a cooperative endeavour. And if you don't agree, then you're not obliged to reciprocate. So he has, this, he has this thought experiment of the public address system. There's a local community, and there's a public address system in this local community that can play music and radio around the community. And people like this. It's not just a general nuisance to the populace. No, people enjoy this. They, they, they get something out of it. And the residents take their turn going up day after day, one a different resident each day, and they provide the music, they tell jokes, they give philosophy lectures, they do all the, the wonderful things that you can do through a public address system. And then comes a day when they come and knock on your door and say, right, it's your turn. You're up today. Um, you know, have fun. We, we enjoy hearing what you can come up with. Are you obliged to go along with that? You didn't ask them to set up the public address system. You didn't ask them to broadcast, and you certainly didn't agree that you would be obliged to do this, and you don't want to do this. So how can anyone, knows it claims, say that you're under an obligation, let alone a universal moral obligation, like that that we're talking about in, in the law, to reciprocate? Another example people often come up with this is that of buying drinks in a bar. If people buy, buy a round, then they look funnily at you if you don't buy when it's your turn, if you say, right, I'm going home now. But does that mean you're obliged to buy drinks for them if you didn't ask them to buy drinks for you? Maybe they were just being generous. You don't have to go along with it, surely. It's not a moral and legal requirement. John Simmons who we met earlier, uh, talking about his objections to natural, um, the, the natural duty of justice. He has a very similar argument. Now he distinguishes here between two different kinds of goods. And he thinks that this may, may be some of what Rawls and Nozick are concerned about. He says that merely to receive goods is not the same thing as accepting them. that we can receive goods without accepting them if we had no way to refuse them. So this is one way in which we might distinguish between people buying drinks in a bar and the public address system. Because if someone buys you a drink in a bar, you can always say, no thanks, I don't want that. I mean, if they just put it in front of you, you can't. But if they say, you know, what would you like to drink? You don't have to say, yeah, I'd, I'd like a pint, please. You can say, no thanks, I'm going to get my own. Now, Simmons thinks, well, if you did that, then you would be under an obligation. But if you couldn't do that, if the pipe was just placed in front of you, or in particular if you have the PA system, then you are under no obligation to, re to reciprocate. You have received the goods, but you have not accepted them. The only way he thinks, therefore, that we could justify obedience to the law of the land 
would be if people either had a voluntary choice whether to stay or not, going back to the idea of tacit consent, we think that most people don't, or that they all agreed that they were cooperating in some joint endeavour, and hence that they would accept the benefits of other people's endeavour in order to contribute their own. As long as that was a public agreement, then the principle of fair play would hold. But as a matter of fact, he says, that's just not how the modern state works. Most modern states, people see themselves as consumers. I pay my taxes. You give me benefits. I feel like there's, I've bought those benefits off you. I'm entitled to them. It's not that you provided me benefits and therefore you're entitled to my obedience. Well, you provide me with those benefits and you're entitled to my taxation. It's entirely the other way around. So if that's the view that people hold, then Simmons argues, it's entirely unrealistic to try and found a principle of political obligation on this basis. George Koklos says, no, no, you've got it all wrong. His argument seems to be based upon the idea that Simmons, Nozick, Rawls, are all, I all have in mind that it's something about the recipient of the benefit that obliges them to reciprocate. That it's the recipient's acceptance, or their agreement, or their gratitude, that gives them the obligation to obey the law. But he says that's just not how it works. The fair play principle is based upon a transaction. That's the relationship we're looking at. And that is not the same as it being based on simply the state of the receiver of goods. Instead, he defines the morally necessary conditions of the transaction that oblige us to obey the law in terms of the size of the goods. In particular, he says that you are obliged to reciprocate the goods that you receive if A, the amount you need to provide makes it worth your while to do so for the provision of the goods. It's not an unfair price. B, the goods themselves are necessary for living a satisfying life. These aren't just luxuries, these are necessities. And C, that the benefits and burdens are being distributed equitably amongst the people who receive the goods. Equitably probably doesn't mean equally here, but something along the lines of according to their ability to pay. So not all the costs are being put on any one individual or something like that. And he gives the example of a pacifist, lives in a non-pacifist country and benefits from the security that the army, the military of this country gives them. Their country would be invaded if they did not have this army and they would be, lose their property and or be killed. But because their country provides military services, they are safe. Now in this case, he says, the individual is obliged to reciprocate, even though he would under no way consent or even accept the goods being offered to him. He's a pacifist. He doesn't believe in this sort of thing. But still, He's not being asked to pay too much. He's not, for instance, being required to fight himself. He's just being required to pay for the others to fight. So it is worth his while. Security is important. This is a necessity for his continuing to exist, live a satisfactory life. And we're assuming the costs and burdens are being distributed equitably. They're not just saying, oh, you're the only pacifist, you have to pay everyone's wages. Kuklas's response to Nozick then is simply that Nozick, sure, he, makes, he gives a ridiculous example. You are not obliged to reciprocate for somebody playing entertainment at you through a PA system because that's just not that important. It's a luxury. You don't need it. You can live without it. Maybe we might also say the price is too high. You're scared of public speaking. You really hate this sort of thing. This would be a, a, you know, you would never willingly exchange the goods, be, you know, what's the service being required from you for the benefits that you've received. 
So that's why we find the case so ludicrous. It's not that people haven't accepted the goods, but that the goods just aren't worth what's being asked. So, so far we've considered these three different moral theories that seem to give us an obligation to obey the law. And these three theories are all theories that, in some way or another, can be seen as tailor-made for this job. I mean, each of them clearly references the nature of the state and our obligations to it. Most people don't say the social contract provides the entirety of morality. And even fewer say that we can explain all of morality in terms of natural duties and or fairness. But they are well-purposed to the job of justifying the existence of the state. And that's why we've chosen to talk about these ones, in particular during this lecture. But in fact, any moral theory can be used to justify the state. Utilitarianism, for instance, is the idea that everyone is morally obliged to do what maximises utility. And some people, indeed it was at one point the dominant position in English moral philosophy from Hume to Mill, argue that that is why the state is justified. The state and the law gives us security, gives us property, allows us to cooperate. That's very utility maximising. We wouldn't want to live without it. Deontologists, you'll come across, who believe, roughly speaking, that we should act according to moral laws, or that if we act, we should only ever do so to a law that, could, that is not an immoral law, might well say that there's something wrong about acting according to a moral law that implies breaking political law of the land. That this couldn't be willed, for instance, on Kant's frame as a universal law, because nobody would want to universally undermine a law that they themselves have created through democratic institutions. Finally, the virtue theorist, and this is actually the oldest argument for the political obligation going all the way back to Socrates in ancient Greece, says that disobeying the law is contrary to justice because it's intemperate. It doesn't involve the right attitude to fellow citizens. It's unwise. All these theories then seem to come up against a common problem, which is how do they deal with our obligations to obey laws that are immoral? All states have laws that are immoral. Even if they don't mean to be, that doesn't mean they're evil. It just means that they don't satisfy the moral test. <coughs> All states have laws that actually do more harm than good, or that imply breaking the categorical imperative of Kant, or that make people less virtuous than they could be. It would be impossible to coordinate huge groups of people with the resources that we currently have in ways that never involve breaking a moral code. How on earth, then, can any moral theory, with such a wide scope, imply that in those cases we are obliged to obey the law. If we know that breaking this law is going to maximise utility, how can the utilitarian say that we are obliged to obey it anyway? Well, it's not a hopeless case. When people provide this kind of justification, they tend to make a distinction between our obligations to obeying any individual law and our obligations to upholding the general the law in general. And so, for instance, we might say that, yeah, sure, in this case, this law removes, you know, reduces people's utility. This is a bad law. But if I were to break this law, it nevertheless might threaten all the other laws. It might threaten the political institutions that uphold the law. So I shouldn't break this law either, just in case. Seems like quite a weak argument. Um, after all, you don't want that law. Shouldn't you go and break it and then just go and tell people, look, that was a silly law anyway, you should have got rid of it to begin with, because I noticed that it's not utility maximising. So, these principles of political obligation, they're still out there, but on the whole they are less discussed, 
they're less significant. And this is the kind of problem that they face. They also face, however, the problem that, as you may remember from political one, sorry, from lecture <coughs> one, we're assuming here that everyone is moral. We are asking if moral people have reasons to obey the law. But if people are moral, and they're obeying the law because it upholds their moral theory, why do they even need the law to begin with? Why can't we all just be good utilitarians, good deontologists, good virtue theorists? What could the law act? Next time. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> One thing I will just say quickly, um, next week I do want to try and have space at the end of the lecture uh, in case any of you have any questions um, about the course, about the material that we covered. Um, so if you have any questions, do bring them to the next week's lecture and hopefully we'll have a slot for dealing with them. <laughs>